Joe, you there? Yes, here, ready to go, Maddie. All right, let's get cracking. Okay, a big welcome to you all and thank you so much for joining uh, our Microgrids in Agriculture webinar today. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we gather this morning and pay respects to the leaders past, present and emerging. As we all know, there's a lot going on in the energy space at the moment, not just here in Australia, but globally as well. Um, here in Queensland, we've had uh, the announcement of the Queensland Energy and Jobs Plan, which outlines a plan for significant renewable infrastructure builds. Um, but I think, you know, more importantly, a new way of thinking around uh, what the future of energy will look like um, here in Queensland. So our members and rural communities more broadly are really trying to work through what the new direction might mean for them, uh, for their businesses and for their communities. For farmers um, and, the mem and our members, the reliability and affordability of energy is absolutely crucial for the future of their businesses. QFF, I believe, has a really important role in um, bringing together key stakeholders, leading industry research so that we can support our members and rural communities to make informed decisions regarding future energy investments that will work for them, not just in the short term, um, but over the long term as well. And I think I think that's um, uh, part, part of the challenge. Um, there is a lot of new technology and a lot of new thinking around um, all sorts of models around distributed um, energy. It is a busy space which translates, I think, to a lot of opportunity, um, but also a lot of risk for farmers and for communities as they try and navigate what is the most appropriate way forward um, and what will best suit their long term goals. So the concept of microgrids has created a lot of interest across agriculture and rural communities. I myself uh, find the concept abs absolutely fascinating and this has been a really important piece of work. I would like to thank the Federal Department of Energy for funding this work, um, but also AER and ARENA for their support and involvement um, and also our project partners, Cotton Australia, REACWA Re and Constructive Energy. So today is a, a wonderful opportunity to hear the outcomes of the microgrids feasibility study, which has been undertaken at four farming locations in New South Wales and Queensland. One of the key takeaways has been that there is absolutely value in having microgrids, not just for farmers, but also for regional communities and networks. Um, but as the discussion rolls, rolls on this morning, we will hear, we really do need enabling um, and collaborative processes and business models to ensure um, that consumers can benefit. So I think enough from me, um, Maddie. Thank you all for joining us. I look forward to um, hearing the discussion this morning. I'll now throw to Maddie from our team at QFF and the project manager to commence proceedings. Thank you so much, Joe, for your time and, and your words today. And I will absolutely echo those sentiments and I'm sure several of the other speakers today will as well. Joe um, came on through partway, I uh, came on to uh, QFF as CEO partway through this project and has just absolutely hit the ground running. It's really been great to have you backing and support um, as we uncover some really exciting gems in this project. Um, so just for the next 20 minutes or so, myself and um, Ash Bland from Constructive Energy will be taking you through what we um, have studied and, and, and discovered and rediscovered and confirmed over the last couple of years. Um, this project, as Joe mentioned, um, is a consortium between Queensland Farmers Federation, Constructive Energy, Reaqua and Cotton Australia. Um, Ash um, and myself represent the team, but um, other team members are here and I just wanted to offer my thanks um, to the rest of the team for all your hard work and it's been a lot of hard work. So it's really exciting to get the, to this point and share what we found with you. Um, but as I said before, to echo Joe's sentiments, there is a national transition happening here. It's it's not just, um, you know, at the federal level where we have um, Albanese's government with the, the Powering Australia um, policies and objectives that he's put forward, but just, you know, a couple of weeks ago, the Queensland State Energy Plan and, and other reciprocal and, and similarly motivated state energy plans are coming forward. Um, but even down at the, the regional level, there is a transition in the sense that um, the, the, the affordability of technology um, has reached a point where, you know, the consumer can take into their hands um, how they want to consume. And that's really changing um, the prospects of what productivity in regional communities and, and on farm looks like. 
um, especially seeing as energy is um, a considerable input for productivity in our regions. Um, so, you know, as we see there, political, technical and ec economic shifts across top to bottom, bottom to top. Um, so why are we looking at microgrids on farms specifically? Um, as mentioned before, energy is a considerable um, input for productivity, often as it relates to the ability to access and move around water on farm. Um, so, you know, if electricity becomes too expensive, then the ability to pump, you know, becomes expensive and then the ability to be productive um, reduces. So a big consideration there for fundamental business models. Um, but as I touched on before, uh, the nature of affordable technology on farms means that the concept of energy independence um, and business resilience and power of choice for the consumer is becoming more appealing and more accessible. And as farmers are adding more and more solar onto their rooftops, they're realizing that, hey, we're probably not actually getting the best value that we could. Um, and, and utilize um, our electricity and share it between our meters or maybe with the farm next door. Um, we have all of these extra seasonal resources, um, energy resources that aren't being optimized. So, so what can we do there? Um, and as, as touched on before, the concept of sharing energy, whether it's on farm or between farms, is something that farmers are, are asking more and more. Why can't we? Um, why can't we do that? So, with all of that in mind, we're balancing a massive shift at the government um, and utilities level and at, as they're completely reconsidering how markets and, and networks are designed and consumers are completely um, rethinking how they're wanting to engage energy consumption. So I think what's um, a really good um, way to set the tone here today is that we need to keep in mind that it's, it is important to balance the needs and the objectives between both the consumer and the networks. We, we're not just advocating for consumers to do whatever they want and, and you know, the networks can, you know, have to keep up. Um, there's a real motivation here on our behalf for, for mutual benefit and, and making sure that we're advocating for win-win scenarios. Um, so I thought I might just go back to basics so that we're all on the same page because it can get quite confusing very quickly. Um, a microgrid is simply um, a physical energy resource or grid that generates, uh, distributes and consumes its own energy in the same physical footprint. Now there's many different configurations. It's not limited to the generation source or the storage source or the distribution um, type or method. Um, it's just that it is a self-contained energy system. It can be disconnected from the grid and often is. Um, it can also be connected into a grid um, or interconnected with several other microgrids as like a nested group of microgrids. The point is that it consumes and distributes to itself and supplies to itself. Um, and with the right technology, more and more governments and utilities around the world are seeing a microgrid as a fundamental building block of, the, of modern grids. Um, so it's probably a good way to to look at that. And so one expression of that, um, if we're taking this basic model here, like I said, it doesn't really matter what the, the load, the, the type of load, it doesn't really matter um, what the off-takers are, the storage, um, it just matters that it's this connected network. So if we extrapolate that out, um, the grid is a platform, um, not just a distribution network or a transmission network, is something that more and more governments are looking at, and more and more utilities are looking at. So that's interconnecting microgrids, you know, these individual building blocks to work either together, like I said before, like they're, they're a nested network um, that does or doesn't connect to a utility grid. Um, there might be a virtual power plant factored in there as well and a community battery or, or um, a blend of any of those. The point is that um, these are consumer level resources that can be interconnected with and without the grid. Um, so there's some really exciting prospects and ways that that, um, that this kind of technology can be um, integrated and arranged with each other. So with all of that in mind, um, we have embarked on a two year research project. Um, we decided to approach four farms, two in Queensland, two in New South Wales, um, to test four different archetypes of commonly occurring um, ag consumer types um, and, and, uh, and a way a microgrid could orient to the grid um, in those uh, specific settings. So we went with a single enterprise, obviously quite self-explanatory, so that's a winery in Pocolbin. Um, end of line, um, if you're in a regional town, it's not uncommon that you end up at the end of a line. Um, so we have a cotton farm in St George that represents that scenario. 
Um, in Mackay, we have a cluster of um, sugarcane farms that are all located in the same region. So we went for a large scale microgrid option um, and then in Wee War. And this might be familiar to those who've been playing along uh, from home from the start, but just to recap to make sure we're all on the same page. And then in Wee War, um, there's a mixed commodity farm. They, we went for an anchor host or a hybrid model. So essentially um, the town there, what's particularly interesting is the town has taken upon themselves to go towards a net zero strategy. They're interested in having a virtual power plant amongst the community. Um, and we saw opportunity there to model either just a hybrid of, of um, uh, two or more of the other archetypes um, from one to three, or to use it as an anchor or a host um, that participates in the virtual power plant. So th those are some different scenarios that we tested out um, and, and evaluated over the course of the project. And it was really important that those archetypes, as you can see the criteria on the right there, they're replicable, practical, they have good impact and they show good partnership um, opportunity, which I think you know we were really lucky to have um, all four of our case studies um, represent that. So what I might do now is hand over to Ash. Um, he is the super technical one. Um, and so he can he can uh, get through this portion of the presentation much more efficiently than I can. It's up to you, Ash. You're on mute, I'm sorry. <laughs> if anyone had that on their um, Zoom bingo, you can tick that off. There you go, isn't that great? Well, I didn't say anything wrong. Uh, during that part. Uh, yeah, no, thank you so much. It's uh, and reiterating. Uh, thank you, Joe, and the whole team and all of the support and working together. It's been a, a really enjoyable, challenging and rewarding project all at once. Um, just picking up on what you said there, Maddie, about uh, microgrids being sort of a way of the future, seen as a future grid. Well, of course, they're actually how our grid started. And and in fact, you know, if you go back to 1860s and, uh, you know, Tamworth still has their steam engine sitting in the main street, which started lighting a microgrid. And really, you're only looking post-war when some of these different microgrids called towns like Tamworth and Bathurst and you know, charters, towers and all that, when they started to get hooked up and into, uh, from the turn of this century, what's evolved into the national energy market. And because humans are involved, it's got all sorts of complexity around it and uh, all sorts of mechanisms. And uh, But fundamentally, you know, the, the concept of being able to be self-sufficient in a discrete chunk of the grid um, is really what we're, what, what we're on about here. And it was important, as Maddie said, to pick those archetypes because we, you know, we all drive up and down the, the country quite a bit and we wanted to do something that, you know, helped helped both the distributed network service providers and the ag sector themselves go, is this a, is this a thing? And, and if so, where can it be a thing? And so on the Picolban uh, case study, you know, whilst that was a winery, there are a lot of a lot of properties that fit that category where you've got a single pole at the at the boundary coming in or a single point of supply to your enterprise. Now from that point it may split. You might have multiple NMIs within your within your buildings, but you could whatever you're doing as a as an agricultural enter enterprise, there are a lot of those scenarios around. And in order for those guys to be self-sufficient, it was really interesting when we when we started to model that. Of course, you need a certain amount of generation. The most obvious form of generation is solar. It wasn't that we looked at that exclusively. It's just the most obvious at the moment because it's uh, cost effective. And, you know, we we did look at bioenergy um, as a as an input, and certainly the models we built could manage that. But in each of these scenarios, it was it was difficult. Um, the We War example was probably the most promising one where the local group and uh, called Jenny Energy and University of New South Wales did a study looking at bioenergy for that too. So I just want to make sure that you guys understand that we, we weren't, we're not solarists, um, but it did turn out being the most obvious and um, cost effective solution to look at in, in these scenarios. Um, and then, of course, we put batteries with that as well because you, you, you don't just run your enterprise during the, the daylight hours. Now, when it came to actually modelling those core system components, um, I'm at pains to point out that behind this rather simple slide here, uh, some really detailed models, um, uh, energy flow models. And what we did was actually get that, uh, the real time data and model that with imaginary systems. 
Now, again, you know, there's lots of probably boffins on the call who who would have a heap of questions around that, and you know, we're happy to to take those, um, you know, or, or in the future. But suffice it to say that we we managed a generation and profile which was dispatchable with a usage profile that was real, and then we pushed it around and we said up, down, more. What if it's wetter? What if it's drier? What if there's more or less load? What if you change your peak? What if you put more or less solar? And, and you know, many of you will be aware that you you come up against a few fundamentals there, which is that it's relatively easy to be self-sufficient up to about 80 percent, even 90 percent. But the last bit is really challenging. It becomes really expensive and a, a you know a reduced return on that. Um, the other thing is in all these business cases, there are a couple of really fundamental things and. And it's basically around capex and value. And, and the, the capex is how, how much does it cost you to do this thing and to implement this thing? And that can end up being a showstopper. The other thing is how much value does it generate? And that value, we used the word value quite deliberately rather than revenue or, or uh, electricity or sale because that value had a whole stack to it, which which included, um, particularly in the, uh, the Mackay example, included the potential for deferred investment, for example, with your network provider. It included things that are that are valuable. We know they're valuable, but they're not actually recognised in the market or the mechanism at the moment, such as resilience, the ability to keep running. So swinging back to per Colburn now, you know, that ended up being quite constrained geographically. So as much as we would love to have put, you know, uh, the amount that our that our model said, well, actually, you know, if to get to about 95%, they'll need about 300, um, oh, sorry, 220 kilowatts of solar. They already had some there, so relatively straightforward, but actually their business is growing wine grapes and we don't want to replace them with panels. Now, Karen, of course, is very interested in agrivoltaics, so that it might not be the case that they had to be replaced with uh, with panels. But parking that, we had to put a certain amount of panels in there and a certain size battery to make that work. And as it turns out, that particular enterprise really doesn't have that space. Um, and then it starts to get really challenging because you're starting to put panels up on different roofs and you know moving things around, and then your capex goes up. You know, so to some extent, um, you know, these are theoretical models um, and it's done that way deliberately because we wanted to learn lessons out of each one that we could apply across the sector. But but parking that for now, that's the sort of system with monitoring and control that would actually be able to provide them with a bit of backup generation with a functional, a functional system. Would it work? Does it pay off? It's a little bit challenging uh, in, our, in our analysis. Um, the, you know, and we'll show you in our future side the, where it does work. But basically, you know, our, our recommendation was, well, you could do it, but do you really want to? And do you want to do it in the sense that you completely disconnect from the grid? Probably not. Um, do you want to do it for periods for resilience and for network service and all that? Well, yes, there is a case for that. St George, um, you know, again, there's plenty of valleys with one line heading up it and, and supplying one or multiple enterprises. Um, and that's, you know, the, the gentleman, uh, the family that run that farm have been very proactive in the renewable energy space and already have a lot of renewables on site. Um, this is one of those examples that actually is entirely doable apart from the legislative and, and rules context that it sits within. Um, what you will notice, though, is that that it's you know there's a fairly hefty price tag in in doing that, and and this as you get bigger, the the, the model kind of flips and starts to be contingent on that value piece, like what where's that energy going and how can you value it? At the moment, if you're just getting your say New South Wales your six cent tariff, for example, that's a little bit challenging. Um, are there higher levels of um, value that can be generated out of the the energy that uh, that a farm you know, a microgrid might give out? Short answer is yes. And in fact, universally, we found that farmers were really attracted to the idea of providing energy for their local towns or villages and, and that kind of thing. And so, uh, you know, if you look at a scenario in the future where farmers are banding together or individually and say, well, no, that's all right, I'll supply the local town with a good chunk of its power. Um, we're also pretty confident, at least anecdotally, that the local town would like to buy their energy from the local uh, 
you know, producers as well. So there's some interesting findings out of that one. Um, and but again, you know, it was we were able to get that one to stack up pretty well. And in and in fact, again, because we did that theoretically, we imagined in the modeling there that the brimble combs had to start from scratch and build all their their solar. Um, actually, you know, they've already got a heap up. So that that is a really interesting case study that's that's quite ready to go. We had quite a lot of conversation and discussion around whether they became a high voltage customer at the boundary, whether you distribute that energy or whether you centralise it, whether you distribute the or just centralise the battery. And of course, the moment you have those discussions, you're up against the, um, the network uh, rules and the settings for distribution. And those have a really material impact on the business case and the viability of any microgrid. That's a key finding, of course. In Mackay, we looked at a virtual scenario there. I mean, to some extent, it could be a physical microgrid, right? You know, but it's just at the substation level. It's going back to the 1800s or 1930s, 40s, whatever, where you say, actually, no, this whole chunk of the network down there um, can be self-sufficient. Technically possible. We, we certainly looked at how that would be done. We did some sizing of the power plant that would do that, which you can see there just for that subset of farmers in reality, quite complex. And what made that sort of complex is the, um, the, the, the way the benefits are shared amongst a group and who gets to participate and how. Um, nonetheless, uh, remains a really, really interesting case study, um, particularly of how a group of common enterprise band together and behave in a certain way as if it was a microgrid um, within, a, within the context of the network and their business. So, that's one I know we're, we're keen to pursue. The last one is WeWar. This is also, you know, a really obvious uh, candidate. And one of the reasons we wanted to do this was because of the, the physical complexity of the site. So it has two feeders, for example. It has on one of the feeders, you know, lots of NMIs related to this enterprise, but also an external customer. So again, you know, whilst the modelling was relatively straightforward, actually the the execution of that, how you, how you um, you know, fit within the rules to run a microgrid here. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time. There's quite a lot of analysis in the report around exactly how that would work. This is also a really interesting one because there's a fundamental problem with irrigation, which says that actually, if you're only pumping for a few months of the year, um, it's really hard to make renewables pay off on that energy usage. Certainly, if you had funded a microgrid this year in large parts of the country, you would have done your money because you weren't actually using your pumps at all uh, unless it was kind of dewatering your house and you shared poor buggers thoughts are out to um, those farmers at the moment uh, impacted by all our, our flooding. So, you know, this this was a really interesting case study in that it it, it recognised the flip where actually to get the, pay, the case study, to, to get it, this to work as a microgrid, that external value from the energy had to be significant, which means it, it ended up being quite massively oversized if you were just sort of talking about, well, I just want to put you know, a few kilowatts behind these pumps and reduce my exposure to the market when I use the pumps. That sort of doesn't really work. So you have to flip it and say, well, actually, I've got this heap of network on my property. It's awesome. Thanks, Essential Energy. Um, why don't I turn it around and fill it with energy and send it off to WeWar or whatever? And that's the basis that this sort of model works on because it's too unreliable to have it fun funded and paying back just from the farmer's use alone. Okay, so in terms of the sensitivity analysis, as we pushed these models around a lot, we had some great peer review, which, which challenged uh, quite a few of our assumptions, which was great. Um, and I think what I could say is those prices are probably low since we first did the numbers, you know, the markets shifted. Uh, quite a bit. The Aussie dollars dropped a lot, you know, but it's almost, you know, yes, it, it, that all those parameters have changed. Our financial assumptions you could argue about till you're blue in the face. The reality is we got close enough to have some significant learnings about each of these archetypes. The grid connected stuff, if the price of that dropped down to about 80%, we reckon that's a goer. You know, if you're an enterprise around there, um, you could have a grid connected microgrid. Um, if the capex was just reduced a little bit. Now, that might be an argument for government subsidies, for an example, um, because the, the driver for that might actually be resilience, network services, stability, that kind of thing that says, OK, well, we want all these sorts of enterprises to be able to run for four or five hours if the power goes out. 
Great, done. Um, in St George, there was a bit more of a saving on the capex, remembering, as I said, that this guy's already got a heap in. But if you are starting as a new farmer somewhere, for that sort of model in that kind of circumstance to work, um, you'd want a bit more subsidy or a bit more um, assistance or you know better market value with your capex. In the virtual microgrid scenario that we've ended up sort of being the preferred way with Mackay, actually, we don't need much money at all. Um, the capex, we're not building a plant here. We're linking, we're linking a series of producers with existing generation in the market, and and we think that's got you know a pretty good model behind it. Finally, in WeWar with the grid connected microgrid of grain, you know you're looking at about if you could just cut the capex back to about 15 uh, by about 15 percent, then that starts to look reasonably attractive over a 12 year NPV term. Of course, you can see there in the net present value that given that the pro the equipment is going to last much longer there is a there is a kick you know there's a there's a longer term um, kick for the producers in in going down that kind of model so that okay Maddie have I missed anything there no I think that's pretty bang on and I know we said we've got a Q&A um, for our portion what I think we might do is kick that to the last 15 minutes we did leave a little bit of an extra space just in case this happened so we'll um, we've got just a couple more minutes for us to run through um, um, our findings. Now, just I, I, we will probably do a bit of a speed run through the findings, but um, just so you all know, um, over the next week we'll be releasing a series um, of articles, um, one pages, two pages, resources on on our findings and whatever else. So I promise you will not be missing out um, on all the good juicy bits. Um, it just might not be in as much detail today. Um, but speaking to what Ash mentioned before, is it's very simple to get caught up in NPVs and and you know arguing these these um, financials, but um, what a value actually is, what's considered viable for the farmer is multivariate quite often. Um, so if you're required to decarbonise um, so that you can continue to supply to, you know, Coca-Cola or whatever, um, then, you know, you're losing your competitive advantage if you don't have a way to decarbonise your farming practices. Um, so maybe you're willing to go a little bit more expensive on the investment proposition so that you have that business benefit on the other side of things. Um, and same goes for, you know, reliability. Maybe um, the processing that you do on farm requires your machinery to run 24-7. And if you have iterative brownouts, then that can be highly disruptive. Um, to your business sustainability and to your business resilience. So again, you might be willing to change the thresholds of what your ROI is in pure financial returns um, because the value in your productivity and your business um, has these other factors at play. Um, so just wanted to keep that in mind and, and, and speaking to what Ash mentioned before, um, there are various ways to receive value. Um, so as as we just mentioned, business and local resilience um, is is a great motivator, um, but also upgrade deferral. So um, utilities will do an assessment before they upgrade their network assets and basically go out to market and say, is there a non-network solution um, that would be cheaper than us doing an upgrade? Um, and so I think there's currently there's not um, a, a process for microgrids and similar infrastructure to fulfill that. Um, that process, but I think there's a really great opportunity there um, for project de developers when they're looking at the financials to consider that this might be considered a good network upgrade deferral um, asset. Um, again, emissions reduction, so um, that's a, a key value driver for farmers there. Um, participating in ancillary and wholesale markets, it's quite quite difficult for mid-scale projects to access, um, equitably access those markets, but there is good value that can still be offered. So that's another um, opportunity there to consider. Also the interest in establishment of local energy markets, so as we mentioned before, sharing in your community and establishing, you know, maybe a local spot price before you then go beyond your distribution network. There's a great opportunity there um, for additional value and of course self-consumption. Um, so we just we just wanted to give you an idea there that um, the idea of of um, what's considered viable isn't just is that um, is that NPV in the red in the black, um, and I, I guess um, to sort of extrapolate on that that narrative a little bit, um, looking at the lowest cost solution, yeah, those are big numbers, those are big figures. Not every farmer can afford um, that kind of an intervention. So what are some lowest cost interventions that they can consider? Well, efficiency is of course a great place to start. Um, and we identified plenty of efficiency um, opportunities still exist for many farmers. Um, so always start with efficiency opportunities. 
Um, but all of these sub every substation that we looked at that these were connect uh, each farm was connected to was underutilized, significantly underutilized. Um, and farmers are wanting to use electricity more. Um, it's just the cost that's the issue. So there's a great opportunity there for improved utilization and improved productivity. If farmers, um, if utilities work with ag to understand their productivity levers in a little more detail and set up tariffs. So, you know, you don't have to go ahead and invest one, one million dollars in a microgrid if good tariffs that reflect productivity just exist. And if that's if it's just the cost that you're um, that you're looking at. Um, and net metering, whether it's meter consolidation or virtual net metering, um, if, if utilities offered that those sorts of products and services, again, is a cheaper um, option. Um, but if we're stacking all of these alternative solutions up against each other, like I said, there's um, affordability, reliability, utilizing my assets, making sure that they're not just being used when we're pumping, decarbonizing, having backup, and the um, benefit to the local grid are all factors here and benefits here that we need to be considering. And so we did a bit of an assessment here about, yes, you know, meter consolidation might be a very, very cheap option, but then it pushes farmers up into a large customer tariff threshold, and that can actually break business models for, for farms. So actually it, does, it is not a lowest cost solution for a lot of farmers there. Um, so again, we'll publish, we'll go ahead and, and put that up. Um, but I just thought that that was a really good way to consider what does lowest cost mean and, and, and what value and, and what does feasibility and viability actually mean in these projects? Um, being mindful of Stephen's time and AER and Arena's time, so we might come back to the lessons learned a little bit later, I think, Ash, um, sure. and hand over to Stephen. And for those who just joined, um, there will be time for Q&A for our project. We'll just leave that at the end. Um, so with that in mind, Stephen. I'd love to, I love to introduce Stephen. Um, we met at a couple of conferences. Stephen has um, gone ahead and implemented um, a microgrid on farm and we would love for him to um, tell you about his latest adventures. Go right ahead. Well, first of all, I'll try okay. and uh, work out how to share the screen uh, properly, Patty. So that will be the first, uh, first trick. So hopefully you can see my screen. Yes, we can. And if you just go full screen mode, that's it. Perfect. Okay. So the company uh, is Alternative Energy Innovations and we're based in uh, Gippsland in Victoria. Um, our main focus is to do any energy solutions that's designed to give you control. And control is one of the main things that we see um, in applying renewables to uh, the agriculture sector. So what we want to talk about today specifically is an on-farm microgrid and its specific feature is that it's a control microgrid, not just the normal microgrid and we'll explain what that means. So I just want to talk briefly about where's the dilemma with uh, the energy dilemma sit with ag in particular in the area we are is with dairy. Cost is obviously one of the significant things that's gone out the roof um, and because uh, most of the dairies in our area uh, have high irrigation, then they have very high costs and it's a major issue. Stress continues to be a problem with the farming sector, not only with energy costs, but they've got rising overheads. There's ESG pressures on the entire supply chain. There's ongoing problems with time and labour and uh, all which have a huge impact on uh, farmer wellbeing and their work-life balance. But there's always been a simple solution, as people will tell me, that solar will fix it. You just buy it and install it. And I think people are finding now that that's not the case. That's quite often you'll put, say, solar on a dairy and you won't get the return that you thought you would get. And that's predominantly because people shift uh, um, energy consuming uh, processes to uh, the middle of the day and there are days when you don't have solar. So this has created a bit of a sour taste in uh, the mouth of farmers and sometimes created unnecessary hesitation and scepticism about uh, taking up new energy uh, opportunities. And then there's the grid. Well, pretty much we all know the grid's in a reasonable amount of trouble. Um, the energy industry knows that it is and they really want customers to participate to fix it. And farmers have a massive role to play. And to date, I don't think the farming community actually realise how big a role they can play. 
Uh, the two-sided market will happen. There's no doubt about it. And we we know that we'll get left behind if we don't do something about it. And with the right technology, we know that we can do something about it in the discussions on microgrid, I believe is one of the key ways of where agriculture can be involved. So what I want to do today is just take you through a, a project we've done in Gippsland on a dairy farm. Uh, it's at Clydeback in Victoria, and it's about three hours east of Melbourne. This is the original farm, and that's the power network that goes through their farm. Each of those dots is a NIMI. Uh, they have had five uh, existing transformers and three kilometres of on-farm on overhead power lines on the site. They had three pumping assets, one that were variable speed drive, or not variable speed drive, variable power pumps. In other words, they could run from, say, 10 to 45 if they were a, a 45 kilowatt pump. And they had a 90 kilowatt diesel uh, from the dam that was supplying um, a mixture of the, well, all those together would supply multiple pivots. They had a 24 volt, the 29 kilowatt solar array on the dairy, and the system was completely manual. So every time they needed to do something, they'd jump on a tractor, the four wheel small tractor things, and drive around the farm, spend lots and lots of hours operating everything, even to the stage if the light stopped on the pivot at two o'clock in the morning, someone would get out, have a look, and go and make it work again, because otherwise in the morning they'd have a massive problem with water everywhere. So then we automated, first of all, we automated all the pumping and the irrigation. That was just to get them to the spot where you could actually do something. So we put another transformer in, got rid of the diesel and put two fixed pumps in, and they supplied most of the irrigation now. Uh, we put some, some of our AEI smart boxes in, and that allowed full automation of all pumping and all irrigation. And then our irrigation scheduling app allowed all of their irrigation processes to be scheduled over a three-day period um, from, it, from this app. So the normal solution once you get to this stage and you can apply solar is to do the usual trick, let's put solar everywhere. So 250 kilowatts of solar, there's three 50 kilowatt systems that would have one application per system and there's one 100 kilowatt solar that had two applications, that's two pivots. So why doesn't it work? This is the problem I think that most people are having trouble to overcome. If you have a fixed power load, which is the red uh, line on the graph, and you have solar, solar can vary. That's four different days of solar generation on the farm. And basically there's no viable solution to allow you to effectively create um, a, a renewable energy project that, that has any sensible answer at the end from a return point of view. What's interesting though is if you have multiple loads and they're fixed and variable, you can actually follow the profile perfectly. And these are day trends from Willandra during uh, last year's irrigation season. So what's the controlled microgrid? It's the new way of doing things. This is a typical dairy um, in Victoria. Uh, some will have many more NIMIs than the five shown there. But you can power, you can supply excess power from a central solar system and distribute it through to the other NIMIs in such a way that when you do it, um, you transfer. So if you've got 30 kilowatts of spare energy at the central um, solar system, you use exactly the same amount at exactly the same time at another place. That way it's controlled. So this is the farm. We applied a microgrid. We were originally going to put 200 kilowatts of solar, put our uh, power management system in, which would optimise all that solar around the farm. And we would um, do everything that's inside the farm boundary. Unfortunately, by the time the project was approved, the um, the uh, network provider ha had uh, moved on and done some other things. So we had to, um, I'll just finish this off. That would give us two power applications that were fixed and 119 kilowatts of variable power that could go from 10 to 190. So we lost support for the microgrid. We took away that. We reduced the central solar to 50, um, moved to 150, moved 50 to another location. 
Uh, we installed a $20,000 cable to a third pump to give us three applications, and we removed the transformer. And now we had our own single uh, uh, microgrid that, were, that was behind the meter that we could test without asking anyone for approval. But basically, we structured the hardware and the control strategy as if it was still behind the existing transformer. So this cut us down from 119 kilowatts of variable power to 37, but in the end, um, the results were still pretty good. So this is the end of a normal day. So on the right hand side here, the green line here is the uh, renewable energy generation from the solar for a given day. The orange in the middle, the, the line stripy bit is the energy that we used. And the orange down the bottom here is the access to the grid. Now you'll see that we did not use this energy here and we'll talk about that in a minute. So the load on that day was supplied 94% from the solar and 90 and 6% from the grid. That's extremely high compared to almost any renewable energy system uh, on, a, on a dairy farm. And the important thing was we cut their bill from 81,328 per annum to 1,253. The interesting thing when we talked about stress before, this farmer this year, uh, uh, she didn't really know what the current power bill was. Um, she certainly did the year before. So I think that's one of the interesting things that was achieved. So what do we want to do next? We want to get rid of the small test uh, centre and bring in the other, the rest of the microgrid. Um, that will allow us to move green power within the farm boundary using existing poles and wires um, and have full control over what we're doing. Um, and then we would bring back in the 119 kilowatts and that spare power that we were looking at before we would be able to use. So this is what the microgrid looks like when it's running. And you can see here that we've got 28 kilowatts of spare solar today at one site and 19 at the other. And the control microgrid just allows us to move that 40 kilowatts to the river pump that's over here, which is a pump that's pumping to a dam, and it can run between 20 and 40 kilowatts. So as this energy varies, that's going back onto the grid, we can vary what's happening at the pump system. So what's needed? We need a controlled microgrid network charge that allows for excess renewable power that's used as an associated DIMI uh, that's, that operates during a five minute period uh, as it's generated. So if you generate it in the five minute period, use it in the five minute period, it's considered to be used um, as an on-farm microgrid. And that's looking at tariffs that are similar to community batteries, which people are talking about at the moment. And of course, if you don't get this sort of local network tariff, you'll never get a community battery system working. So now we're the next step, we're connecting to a project called The Edge, which has got an arena grant which involves AEMO and Osnet services. They're managing DERs in the network using dynamic operating envelopes. And for people that don't know what they are, they basically say how much you can use or put back into the network. And we'll be the first farm connected to the system, which will allow us to help the network. And we're even looking at the potential of doing voltage regulation, power factor adjustment um, using the farm. We expect that connection to be operating within the next month. Then we want to run a micro trial of 10 dairy farms across Victoria, which every each farm having a battery, which allows us to share energy between farms and with the community. What are we doing with future farming? The network support of voltage regula regulation, reactive power and FCAS as a possibility. Flexible demand management is a big thing that can be applied, especially to the irrigation industry because you can bring loads forward when there's high renewables in the network and you can delay the loads when there's not. Um, and you can be involved in community power and the retailer market, to name a few, which is what uh, Maddie and Ash were talking about before. Stephen, um, no. sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, while um, so we've just hit your 10 minutes there, and what I might do is if anyone has any questions, do you mind just popping that in the chat right now? Um, and I'll just give you an extra like 30 seconds to wrap up. And we'll Last go. slide, Maddie. Those questions, perfect. <laughs> so 
Agriculture can make a big difference. You can reduce the carbon print, but you can become a participant in the two sided energy market and it will only occur if we make it happen. Thanks, Manny. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, and I think what's really great about um, Stephen's particular model there of um, it's a it's a highly engineered solution, um, and it's very specific to that site. And but I think what it does it it, it speaks to um, the fact that microgrids it, it doesn't necessarily matter um, what the internal configuration is. The point of a microgrid is that it is tailored to the solution at hand. Um, I think it's quite easy for utilities especially, and I can understand why, to get caught up in, um, please give us the technical model, the archetype, the what's the package, can you give it to us? Um, when in fact, um, it's less about um, exactly what's happening internally because that's very specific to the, the, the consumer's needs. And like I said, Stevens is a great example of that. So we just had a question come in from Hamish, I'm assuming that the smart box is the brains of the ability to control the energy distribution. Stephen, would you like to answer that? Yes, uh, yes, that's correct. The, the, there's effectively two brains operating in this system. One's the irrigation scheduling, which allows us to um, automate irrigation based on a scheduling basis for each application. So we're not trying to say how you irrigate, we're just determining when based on how long you said you want it to run. And then there's a sitting over the top of that is a smart box that has an energy management profile in it that optimizes the cost and minimizes the cost that it would take to do it. Excellent. And any other questions? Oh yes, Pamela. Um, so great presentation. Yes, 100% agree with that. Thank you for providing the detail. It looks like it has to be ta uh, tailored to every individual site. How much time do you need to spend on site to understand the constraints and opportunities? Uh, pretty much um, it is tailored to each site, but it's probably about a, a one or two day review of the site. The system is basically configurable, so it's not like we program for each site. Um, and then it's also um, made so that you, you put a smart box on each NIMI. It has six pump, a maximum of six pumps and six applications per NIMI, and then you just join them together and the management overview system basically works uh, based on the number of smart box NIMIs you've got. Excellent. And then Ian has a question. Um, he's wondering whether that smart box can handle a factory situation, so industrial loads. Uh, yes, it can handle industrial loads. In fact, the, the, the smart box is purely a, a, a small computer with software in it. Um, it could do any load management system. Uh, in fact, we're looking at um, using one on a pub in Adelaide, uh, which will control um, solar, um, a synchronising generator, and um, and inter interacting to uh, price in the market and also um, controlling the peak power usage. Great, and then Hamish, we've just got two more questions left and then we'll have to move on. Um, Hamish asked, does the smart box have the capacity to switch consumption on and off as excess gen energy is generated? Uh, yes, it can. Um, I'm not totally sure what's meant by excess energy generated um, um i would I may or may not be right in assuming that if there's excess um that you then are directing it to you know and that it's utilizing um excess across the whole system basically the whole concept of the power management system is to utilize every bit of energy that it can one of the key things we're getting a bit sidetracked in at the moment is the use of batteries Battery seems to be the thing that tries to make everything easy. The first thing you really need to do is if you generate it, use it. If you're starting to think, oh, it's easier to put in the battery, forget it. This farm return has no battery being used in the time that that um, system was done. It has a 50 um, uh, kilowatt hour battery installed, but we didn't actually use it because we were really using that to smooth out the solar and found out we didn't need to. Fantastic. And in 20 words or less, can you mention the Renewable Energy Action Plan you developed for Willandra? Real quick. 
basically the renewable energy action plan is what we've just presented. Um, we basically went through those steps. We produce a, an action plan, which we do for any facility, including a golf course that we're currently running now in Adelaide. Um, and therefore you go to a farm, you produce the energy action plan, a little bit like an energy audit, but the focus is renewables. And the focus is control, getting control of what you're doing. And the, the key thing that you can learn out of the whole system at, at Willander is buy systems, not equipment. Great. Thank you very, very much, Stephen, for your time. Um, and when we send out the recording of this webinar, we'll also make sure we add Stephen's contact details if you have any further questions. Um, now, as Stephen mentioned, what um, would really help with the proliferation of this kind of technology and these kinds of systems um, is enabling tariffs and regulation. And um, in our lessons learned, we've identified the same thing as well, that the technology, the systems, uh, the configuration is not the challenge. It's not the issue anymore, and it hasn't been the issue for quite a while. Um, but it is, in fact, the an enabling environment so that we can um, push um, business models um, forward for um, for these kinds of systems. So with that in mind, um, I would love to introduce Lyndall from the Australian Energy Regulator, AER. Um, she's part of a really exciting um, uh, regulatory innovation um, initiative. And uh, with that, I will just hand on over to you, Lyndall. Thank you. Thanks, Maddie. And look, thank you very much to QFF for inviting us to be here today. We're really pleased to um, start returning the favour that QFF and particularly Maddie has uh, shown us over the past few months in user testing and making sure that the product we have developed is as fit for purpose as possible. So my name's Linda Bubke. I'm the Acting Director of the Regulatory Sandboxing Team at the Australian Energy Regulator. So I'm here to talk today just quickly about the Energy Innovation Toolkit, which is a kind of uh, regulatory sandbox. It's got a few other functions, but I'll I'll talk a bit about what we can do. I'd like to preface it by always try, like, try and emphasize this is a free service provided and funded for by the federal government um, and it is designed to serve energy innovators such as yourselves. Been really interesting to hear from you guys about the projects you're working on and these trials. Um, really promising results from that and that's the sort of project exactly that we love to get involved with and offer our services to. So I can get this to work. What is regulatory sandboxing? Um, it's a term used in both energy re re regulation and IT to sort of describe a safe space, a safe environment to trial new ideas free of regulatory burdens that might apply under other circumstances. So this is a new way that we at the AER and our project partners are engaging with the sector. And uh, this particular regulatory sandbox, the Energy Innovation Toolkit, has a few different components. I will um, I, I will note that I'll probably drop a link in the chat. My colleague Liz is here today. Maybe Liz, if you wouldn't mind dropping a link to the website in the chat. Uh, this is the website we provide. It's got a lot of really helpful resources. It is our um, uh, entry way to getting getting access to the team, all of the information and resources we've got free and are readily available online. Thanks to that, Liz. Here are our project partners. So something that we are really conscious of is that there is an awful lot of regulation in the energy sector. I used to be an energy lawyer back in the day, so I am horrifically familiar with just how, how complex and overwhelming it can all be to try and navigate this field. Something that also is horrifically complex is the sheer number of bodies that you might need to talk to to get a project off the ground. Um, with that in mind, we partnered with all of the other market bodies, the federal ones, including AEMO and EAEMC, as well as in Victoria, the Essential Services Commission, who has responsibility for the retail framework in Victoria. We've also project partnered with ARENA, and it's lovely to see that they'll be here today. ARENA is project partnered um, as sort of a, in their capacity of referring matters to us where we can provide assistance to people seeking funding from that body. So by seeking help from the Energy Innovation Toolkit, one of the best benefits that we can provide is access to our project partners, a one-stop shop, as it were. So what do we do? We've got a few different services. The first one is one that is live as we speak. It launched a couple of months ago. Uh, it is the, the Innovation Inquiry Service. So it is the first port of call, I think, for most inquiries, for most matters. It is a free guidance service. Hi, we've got an idea. We'd love to launch this idea. We're not sure what regulations might apply. We've got a really fully fleshed idea, but we're encountering this particular issue and we want to get to a bit of a landing on what that might look like, what that might involve, what regulations might apply, or even the other end of the spectrum. We've got an idea, but we don't have a clue how to actually go about 
getting this started? What do we need to be aware of? What do we need to do? Who do we need to talk to? And those are the sort of questions that we deal with all the time at the moment. Lots of inquiries, breast spanning that broad spectrum. Um, and that's, again, free and ready now. So we, what we do as a group is we take an inquiry, we distill it down to the questions that we think they need to know. We then go out and liaise with our internal, the AER subject matter experts, and also the external subject matter experts at AEMO, at the AEMC, at ESC, etc., to make sure that the guidance that we're giving is as comprehensive and as accurate as possible and that they've considered all of the different people they'll have to engage with to get something off the ground. The next two powers are dependent on legislation. We will be we will be glued to our seats this afternoon watching South Australia's upper house debate our thankfully bipartisan supported bill, um, but pending that one passing hopefully today, which is very exciting, we will very soon be able to provide trial waivers and trial rule changes with our project part of the AEMC. So this is where proponents who potentially have come through using the IES, they've used the inquiry service, they've worked out what the regulatory framework might be, we've identified any barriers that might exist, or people who, for example, are really well, um, really far down the line of their project, they've worked out exactly where the pain points are, what's not going to work, where the regulatory barriers exist. And subject to a number of criteria that we have to consider, our agency will have the power to offer either a trial waiver, a waiver of a rule within the national energy laws and rules. So that's not state based, unfortunately. So for state safety requirements, um, technical requirements um, and certain state licensing requirements, we cannot give waivers of those. But for everything under the national energy laws, rules, more or less the retail rules, gas, electricity, um, quite a broad waiver power for most most rules and rules and regulations that are likely to apply to a project. The other power is the sort of complementary rule change power, which looks and feels quite similar, but it is a rule change rather than a waiver that would apply for a period for both up to about five years with the possibility of a one year extension. So those are allowed, they don't have to be that long, they can be much shorter depending on the need. If there is a good idea, that wouldn't cause negative outcomes, that would cause positive outcomes, but is prevented by out of date regulation that really should have been updated because technology is changing quite quickly. That's exactly where these services come into play. And as I mentioned, they should be launching very quickly pending this afternoon's Legislative Council hearing. What kind of inquiries and trial applications have we received? So we haven't received any formal trial applications yet because of course that power is incoming. We have had a number of initial inquiries about ones that are likely to become trial applications. We've had everything so far. We've had microgrids. Microgrids are obviously a hot topic. They are something that a lot of people are seeing the value in. The ability to not just generate and manage your own needs, but also to manage the needs of your community. So we've had a lot of inquiries, anything from islandable microgrids designed to improve reliability, resilience in the network through to much smaller ones about peer to peer effectively. We've also had inquiries about virtual power plants. We've had inquiries about electric vehicle charging, batteries, energy efficiency, retailing, a lot of metering questions. Metering will always be an issue in these, in, in these matters that we have to consider. And then also ancillary services, how people can actually monetize the work that they're doing, how you can make it profitable. Uh, to talk through a couple of examples, I thought I might focus on one recent, a couple of recent ones we've looked at involving microgrids. Um, in one example that we're about to publish some online guidance for, we worked with the township of Cabago, which is in rural um, New South Wales, and their project partner the, with Essential Energy, the local DNSP. Uh, we also worked with ITP, which were um, providing some guidance on the matter and some technical support and looked at a set of really complex questions that would enable an islandable microgrid to exist. Um, and with an islandable microgrid, this is something that looks and feels like a SAPS, but isn't quite a SAPS because it has that ongoing connection to the, mic to the, to the market. But what it would allow these people to do is if a fire comes through and knocks out your main feeder line, the town goes on and they're not left in a situation like they were in 2019, where they had six months without reliable connection to the grid because of fire damage. So a really positive project, um, a good example of sort of the complexities that we can look at, but also of the help that we can provide in showing them, look, I think we got to the end of it and we realised there weren't any specific barriers that would prevent that from happening. There's a couple of things we might need to work with them on 
and there might be some minor settlement anomalies, there might be some minor tariff anomalies, but those are things that our teams internally and within our project partners were really happy to work with them on to find a solution. So at the end of the day, we couldn't really find a barrier because we were prepared to work with them to make that to get that off the ground and get it running. Hopefully we'll start to see some practical trials of that in the next few years once a few technical details are ironed out. So that's a, an example of something that we can add some value to. And again, to emphasize, this is a free service. It's available to anyone in Australia who's got a good idea, even technically if you're outside of Australia, if it's within the Australian energy environment, we can give you some guidance, some fast, frank feedback on what might apply what you'd want to be aware of, but also what exemptions might be out there, what avenues there might be to work within the existing framework and also to work outside of the existing framework through trials. I've tried to be quick because I know we're running a little bit behind, but I hope that's helpful. Um, happy to take questions a bit later after my colleagues at Arena speak, but I hope that's been useful. That has been absolutely fantastic, Lyndall. Thank you so much. And I am going to take privilege and ask a question first. Um, later on because yeah I, I think what you guys are doing is absolutely wonderful so thank you for making the time and um, we'll loop back after Arena's presentation um, for, for questions. Um, so as Ash has mentioned as well um, previously that there is um, there is a scope here for us to for um, enabling financing to help sort of bridge the gap and, and really help tip some of these demonstration projects into um, you know, to help to help tip the market forward and 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 progress um, the market environment for microgrids, um, and that's why we have Arena. Um, they've done a wonderful job with the large scale solar market in in really bringing the viability of that forward. Um, and uh, there's a new program called Ramp um, that is wanting to do the same for microgrids. Um, so without further ado, I'll um, introduce Tom from Arena Arena's Ramp program, who. Um, yeah, speak for the next 10 or so minutes and then we'll go into Q&A. Thank you very Thanks, much, Tony. Um, I'll just get my slide sharing. Is that visible for everyone? Looking good. Perfect. Great. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Tom Connell. Um, I work in the business development and transactions team at Arena, um, which is sort of market facing team um, that interacts with people and helps them bring applications uh, through our process. Um, so for a bit of background um, and the objectives of the Regional Australia Microgrids Pilot Program or RAMP um, is a bit easy to say. Um, uh, the, the way that Arena um, uh, pursues projects and provides funding is, is generally through two um, channels. Um, so we have a pool of funds um, that we use to support projects aligned um, with our objectives, with the arena objectives. And then from time to time, um, the government uh, provides funding to arena uh, through budgetary measures um, to, to um, for us to facilitate the delivery of their objectives. Um, and this uh, ramp program was one of those. So um, the government previously had a funding program delivered separately, um, which was the Regional and, Rem and Rural Communities Reliability Fund. Um, which uh, basically supported uh, feasibility studies into uh, regional microgrids. This program um, is the deployment side of things, so sort of a somewhat of a successor to that earlier program. So the objective of the program um, is to improve the resilience and reliability um, in regional Australia um, through pilot microgrid demonstrations, um, and as part of that, remove the sort of remaining barriers, whether they're technical, commercial, or regulatory, so that future projects. Um, can get up without without support. So the kind of high level um, requirements of projects through this program, um, they need to have a feasibility study completed um, and some more details on that later in the presentation. Um, they actually have to be deploying something, um, putting equipment out into the field, um, located in a regional or remote area. Um, and that basically excludes anywhere, um, sorry, includes everywhere that's not a capital city. So um, outside of that, um, it's all included. Um, demonstrate that it's going to improve the resilience and reliability uh, in its application. And um, as I said, remove the final barriers um, to deployment, commercial, technical, and regulatory. In terms of what the microgrid can be under the program, um, we've deliberately taken a, a very open approach um, and, and sort of to let the market come to us and tell us uh, what makes sense. 
Um, so that might be an embedded microgrid um, which is connected to the grid um, and you know it might may be islandable or not um, but you know at, at, a, at times may still rely on grid um, supplied electricity. Um, it could be a standalone power system um, which is sort of a you know small scale um, might be a generator and a solar system and a battery um, and also remote um, isolated microgrids so um, there are you know, communities and towns across Australia that uh, are off-grid essentially um, and may be supplied by generators. Um, so microgrid projects there are also um, eligible. This is kind of an overview of um, some of the key features um, of the program. So it opened in September 2021 um, and is essentially open until um, 2026 there or until the funds run out. The total amount of funding available under the round is $50 million. Um, and it's envisioned that the typical grant size will be uh, one to five million, um, but uh, it can be smaller than that. And the, and the sort of minimum size is two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. With that, it's important to note that um, under the guidelines, the maximum contribution that Arena can make is fifty percent of the total project cost, um, and so that that will put a limit on that as well. Um, in terms of the process of of submission, that there's no um, cut off dates other than that final end of round date um, so we can take applications at any time um, and they'll be assessed on an individual basis um, as opposed to sort of tender scenario um, so in addition to the objectives of the round with the um, removing barriers and improving reliability and resilience um, arena does place a portfolio view um, in its assessment, um, which basically looks at projects that Arena's funded um, or that are already existing in the market um, and considers um, what new things um, the proposed project will do relative to what's sort of business as usual. Um, in terms of how we assess the projects, um, there's kind of two portions. Um, there's eligibility, which is the you must do and you're either in or out. Um, and then there's the uh, merit criteria, which is um, uh, more detailed uh, you know, assessment of the project and, and its relative merits. So within the eligibility, um, in terms of who can apply for these grants, um, it's pretty broad. Um, companies, state-owned corporations, local government, charities, universities, um, most sort of uh, uh, applicants, um, obviously it's available to, um, individuals and partnerships are, are ineligible. Um, eligible projects are on the next slide. Um, and then just a few other things must take place in Australia. Um, some, some criteria on gender equality and modern slavery. Um, and the last one, knowledge sharing. Um, that's, you know, we said arena, like that is our return on investment. Um, we, the information that's learned through project um, will be shared by arena. And so just a commitment um, that um, the applicant will comply with our knowledge sharing template. So in terms of eligible projects, um, as I said, must have a feasibility study, um, the details of which I'll come to. Um, must be deploying equipment and technology, um, and which also includes uh, renewable energy, um, and also uh, is in a regional or remote area. So uh, I should say as well, all this information is in the program guidelines, and I can drop a link into the, the chat after this. Um, so these are the, the mandatory requirements as part of the feasibility study. Um, so describing what the project, what you're planning to do, where it is, um, what the technologies are, um, and then some financial analysis of it as well. Um, so, you know, justified budgets um, and a financial model um, to understand, uh, you know, both what the budget is and then ongoing revenue and costs. Um, so we can help size what the appropriate grant for the project should be. Um, and then also just providing information to support the guidelines. So. Um, what is the what are the barriers that this project is going to help overcome um, and assist the future projects? So um, the way that that process uh, of assessment happens, um, unlike some of our other programs, this is uh, technically a one stage process um, where normally we would have an expression of interest um, and then um, yeah. a, a full application. This is uh, intended to be somewhat easier in that um, you can submit a feasibility study um, to us first, um, which is basically a tick in the box that you've met all those criteria on the previous page, um, and some feedback might um, be given as part of that review, um, and then you basically come straight to the full application. 
Um, and as part of that, um, you'll be assessed against those eligibility and merit criteria. So on the merit criteria, um, the first one um, are those points I've already talked about. So improving resilience and reliability, um, removing barriers to the deployment of microgrids, um, and just taking that portfolio lens um, to, to see that the proposed project uh, is um, sort of not repeating what already exists in the market. The rest of the criteria uh, are more around the design of the project itself. Um, so with applicant capability and capacity, um, that's looking at um, is, is the proponent of this project and their partners um, suitably equipped to deliver the project? Do they have the relative um, relevant technical project management, financial, um, regulatory expertise um, to be able to be successful? Um, and do they also have the capacity in terms of available staff and, and people to, to manage the project? Um, merit criterion C, the project design and methodology. Um, that's a view of how developed the project is. Um, is the financial model in good shape? Um, have risks um, been identified and under mitigation strategies in place for those? Um, and then merit criterion D um, is, is, you know, does the financial do the finances make sense? Um, depending on, um, you know, I guess sensitivities to cost and are there other sources of funds that are going to be required to, to get this project over the line? So that's actually it for, for the presentation. And I guess I'm open it up to questions for either myself or AER. Perfect. Um, thank you very much, Tom. And uh, I will probably be annoying you in the not too distant future. Um, so that's really I, I, exciting. I would hope that's the case. <laughs> Good. Um, I might go to Lyndall first. Um, you mentioned that um, yeah, there's a big decision to be made in the South Australian Parliament. For those who don't know, a lot of the energy um, policy decisions from a federal level have to be approved um, in the South Australian Parliament for it to yeah, be approved elsewhere. Um, should that approval go through, fingers crossed, um, how long do you anticipate before um, people can apply for waivers and, and start to activate that portion of the reg sandbox? Thanks, Manu. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it should be pretty quick. I'm pleased to say. So there's a few administrative steps that need to happen. So let's say it passes this afternoon, although it is number nine on the um, itinerary and po politicians do like to talk. So um, it might be that it happens maybe one of the sitting dates later this week. If it doesn't, there are still two more sitting weeks in the calendar year. So from whenever it passes, there's a couple of weeks of administrative uh, stuff before it gets assented to, and then the corresponding rules, the energy rules that sit underneath the legislation are approved by the Federal Energy Minister. Um, let's say it passes this afternoon. By Christmas, I think we'd, we'd realistically be able to have it up and running, and if it wasn't exactly by Christmas, it would be upon our organisation reopening on the 2nd or 3rd of January next year. So we're talking within a couple of months, um, and that's probably... Um, I don't think, realistically speaking, it's likely to be much later than that. But of course, with with um, Parliament, things can happen. Uh, in terms of our processes, we're pretty ready to go. We've been ready for a few months. The legislation had its first year birth, first birthday in Parliament, which is something you never want for a bill that affects your work. Um, we had a little birthday party for the bill a few months ago, so Excellent. we're ready when <laughs> it's ready. And um, just as a follow up to that one, um, you did mention that there is some state regulation that um, AER can't approve of that some projects might see as um, as a barrier. Are you seeing any states um, starting to establish like reciprocal entities um, or collaboration? We've certainly reached out to a couple. Um, the generally speaking, the state based regulation isn't the meteor part of the puzzle. The media part of the puzzle is particularly because all of these states on the eastern coast and South Australia and Tasmania are within the federal framework. Um, in WA, they are looking to introduce because that's obviously outside of the NEM. They're looking to introduce their own sandbox in the near future, which is really exciting. And our neighbours across the pond in New Zealand are also introducing one as a point of interest. But generally speaking, we've um, reached out to the relevant agencies within the states to sort of get conversations started. Um, in Queensland, for example, there are a couple of um, regulations that apply, licenses that are required outside of, uh, in addition to those that appear in other states, um, but they're reasonably limited and we're able to sort of point people in the right direction on those.
Sorry, there's a bit of lag on the mic there. Alan, thank you very much for your question there. I will, um, I think Ash and I will take that one. Are there any questions specific to um, ARENA and AER's presentations while we have them? I can very quickly respond to Alan's first question. Sure. Um, in terms of feed-in tariffs in pricing, that's something a little bit outside of our expertise at the moment because we can't effectively match people up with the right buyer. And that is something that we can appreciate is a big barrier for a lot of people. Most people who've reached out to us actually aren't experiencing as many regulatory barriers as they are commercial ones, and that's the reality at the moment. Um, tariffs are reformed quite regularly, but also um, private parties aren't something that we sort of get in between in terms of the commercial realities there, unfortunately. Too easy. Um, and Tom, you've you've the fund has been open for a few months now um, and receiving applications. Um, are you able to give us an example of, um, you know, as much as you're allowed to disclose of a project that's come through that um, that is of interest and and all the all, yeah or in general more broadly speaking the the type of um, projects that you guys are looking forward to seeing come through. Yeah, I, I can't I can't speak to project specifics, unfortunately. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, in interesting things that the sort of either we've seen through the program, the market, um, you know, there's interest uh, for networks, um, you know, particularly for um, homes or farms at the at the end of long spur lines. Um, the bushfire prone will have um, uh, you know high maintenance costs um, to convert those to standalone power systems. Um, that's kind of an interesting area. Um, but that Western Australia is kind of um, charging ahead on, um, but the, the East Coast has, hasn't done so much on yet. Um, uh, I, I think some work, I guess, thinking in you know agricultural sector, um, trying to link up um, different farms or different, um, I guess, assets in an area um, as kind of a shared microgrid, um, particularly if they've got loads um, that are sort of complementary, um, and, and that, you know, that could be quite useful. Um, but yeah, happy to speak to anyone sort of in a bilateral kind of context um, if they've got a project. Too easy, thank you. And what we might do if there's no other questions just for the time being, if uh, we'll get Tom and Lyndall to both send through um, the preferred contact if people have additional questions after the webinar. Um, thank you both for your time and your expertise. It's really great to see that there's um, regulatory and, and financial support to sort of reduce the final barriers. So thank you. Um, now what we might do is we'll Ash and I will blitz through our lessons learned on this project. Um, and like I said, these will, this is probably going to be the meatier side of things that um, we'll publish elsewhere later. Um, and we'll make sure that there's some time there for um, Q&A as well on our pro particular project. So um, Ash, just feel free to chime in and, uh, and I'll just um, sort of plug through this. So as we mentioned before, um, we really do recommend just because there are um, risks uh, in the market um, and, and some technical and pricing risks that you solve as much of your energy behind the meter first. Um, keep it as modular as possible so that you are a little protected from any um, any market changes. As you as you probably noticed, um, the market is changing quickly and, and, and quite extreme in some ways also. Um, and as Ash mentioned, um, what we see at the moment is most people are financially able to metabolize about 80% um, of your energy assets and energy consumption covered by solar plus battery. Anything over that tends to be a bit cost prohibitive. Um, and so that's why we went ahead and recommended grid connected microgrids because it, it does help balance um, that investment threshold. Um, connectivity and access to skills in regions, both are essential um, for this kind of technology to go ahead. And so that is a really big challenge um, that, you know, project developers are just going to have to reconcile with um, and, and work with communities and work with government to improve. Um, it's really hard to have smart tech if it, if it can't use its brain um, because the internet keeps dropping out every other second. Um, so yeah, it's really, really critical. And, and in fact, in other projects we've been speaking with, with local governments about their interest and appetite, and they just said the biggest risk for us is local access to skills for these more sophisticated projects. So that's another big, big consideration there. Um, brownfield solutions. So, um, you know, if you are connected to the grid and quite embedded into the network, um, it, that can be quite tricky to find a way that you're not replicating infrastructure. So, so resolving some of that management virtually is, is a really good way to, um, to conceptualize and, and to build systems around that. 
Um, and at the moment, if you're a small or mid-scale project, the connection process um, on state and federal levels can be can be quite um, inaccessible or cost or time prohibitive. Um, it's not as streamlined as it probably could be for the scale of the project. So that's those are some challenges that we found some developers come up against. When it comes to ag specifically, um, agrivoltaics and virtual power plants are a really good alternative, um, especially in somewhere like Pocolbin where you lack the space and there is prime ag land that you just don't want to lose. So that's a good thing to consider. If you are edge of grid, microgrids are a great. Um, again, this is speaking exactly to what um, Tom just touched on. Um, microgrids are a really great resilience, the, uh, resilience asset. Um, so Cabago as well, um, Malacuda has um, down in Victoria has installed a community battery for the same reason. It gives you protection against natural disaster and frequent grid outages, which if you're at the edge of grid, um, there's a high chance that you're going to experience. Um, if you're a microgrid located, possible microgrid project located near a town, as we mentioned with WeWolf, there's a good opportunity there to establish an off taker or an agreement with a community. Um, and, and more and more communities are, like I said, thinking about how can we share and, and, and distribute locally. So don't um, factor that out when you're considering an off taker in your business model. Um, but also collective action is, is um, when it comes to ag and energy, is a really, really good opportunity to aggregate the impact and the benefit. Um, whether you're in a single commodity region, so cane is a really, really good example of, of high density co-location of energy consumers. Um, or if you're a co-located supply chain, so if you have um, horticulture of various seasonalities, um, you have a processing plant, um, a storage facility, all kind of located in the same region. Um, there's a really good opportunity there for you to um, establish a, an energy system and an energy network um, or tariffs, ag productivity tariffs um, that can um, not just improve the end the cost of energy for you collectively, but also help improve the utilization of the grid um, if that system is integrated into the network well. Um, I might. Just looking at time, I might have you guys start chucking some questions in the in the chat there. Um, uh, I think we'll go ahead and um, yeah. So I, I think we might just get to the final question: Is are microgrids viable, and and specifically for ag? Um, as mentioned before, there there are some regulatory challenges there, but that doesn't mean these aren't viable. Um, it, there are currently um, overseas. Um, Box Power is a really good, good example of a a well-established project developer for rural and remote microgrids. So as you know, project developers are already doing this. Um, in the UK, the government has plenty of funding and has had funding and strategic objectives for the last decade for community energy, whether it is microgrids, VPPs, um, local energy markets or similar. So that's been happening for, like I said, the better part of the last decade. And in the US, um, if you just look at the map there on the right, um, Step, multiple states are developing microgrid tariffs and other supporting um, financial and regulatory models to make sure that this um, change is enabled from the top down. Um, so yeah, it's viable. You just got to make sure you have an enabling environment. And I think that's the case with, with any market um, and any new product and technology. Um, so I just want to, yes, there are challenges, there are barriers, um, but I just want to keep that in mind that um, there is a bigger picture here that um, with the right in encouragement, um, there is no reason why microgrids can't be a, a great consideration in ag and, and especially for regional communities. So with that in mind, um, really did speed run that, Ash. Um, we might look at some questions. Yeah, I think um, I can start by addressing Alan's question there with a with a little preamble, and it was great to have Stephen um, presenting that, that model down there. Because well, I mean, what Stephen's done really is apply a scalpel, and and really particularly, and the, all that stuff about control is is so right. You know, the first thing you should do is look to control, and and when we looked at uh, what was controllable for some of our our case studies, there were vast chunks of energy that just weren't. You know, so when you're using 300 kilowatt hours for seven days straight, and then not again for another two months. You know that that's challenging. So um, and similarly, like the Colburn was another great example. Where actually, the bulk of their energy demand is in in cool rooms and keeping wine cool and chillers. You know, and that's just this big fat chunk that sits there all year. 
And that's why, that's why in that in looking at the viability of those things, we had to look at that external value thing, like, because because really, I mean, as you say, this is why there's a horses for courses, because in some instances you can do exactly what Stephen said, and that'll be great. In others, the only way this will be viable is if you can find an external value for that energy, and that's exactly what's behind Alan's question. Now, Alan, in there, um, you know, the, the ergon feed-in tariff, we had exactly the same. So we modelled these scenarios against the Queensland and New South Wales spot price market. We modelled them with FGAS. We, like, we took a, put a lot of effort into modelling what you could do. And then in the end, what was implicit in that drawing is that actually, if you just make it bigger, then your fixed cost percentage, effectively you're building a solar farm, a distributed generator, right? And that is the conditions of viability. If you ask yourself there, you know, if you're wanting, to, the farmers would hope to be given something in the region of 30 cents. Well, you've got to ask yourself why a retailer is going to pay you $300 a megawatt hour for electricity when they can go to the market and get it for, what, 150, 30, you know, notwithstanding that it's all over the shop at the moment. Now, there may be answers to that question, which is that, well, actually, in order to de-risk the exposure in their market for somewhere else, there's somebody who will be paying 300. It's like, man, if you can just give me 300, that'll save me paying 450, great. You know, So you, you really, in you know, that's, we've sort of glossed over it in this, in this whole presentation, but if you're doing this microgrid tied microgrid thing, and it's flipped from something which which Stephen so eloquently uh, illustrated there, which is about control and reduced costs and looking after. If it's flipped from that into something that is actually around, well, how are you interacting in the broader ecosystem? Then that the Alan's question it becomes the the limiting factor. And and I think we heard that in the government presentation before, saying very often the barrier here isn't isn't legislative. It's actually just financial. Um, can you get somebody to, to get your offtake? Can you get uh, an operation regime or something? The other thing I wanted to add to that is let's not forget the emerging um, opportunity for non-grid distributed value. So in other words, what happens when you can charge your electric fork lifts, cars, farm vehicles with that energy? Well, that tilts it again. What happens if you can make, um, you know, fertilizer, whatever it is, you know, hydrogen products. You know, I think those are also going to have a great impact on microgrids into the future. That's enough from me, thanks. Any other questions um, before we wrap up there? And um, while people are mulling that over just in the last couple of minutes, um, just so you know, QFF's next steps on this, won't be a second, Stephen. Um, QFF and the, and the team are really excited to go ahead and, and, and look at the regulatory sandbox and arena. Um, so we'll keep you posted on, on where we do end up with that. Um, that's just pending um, farmers' interest. Um, there's also, you know, great potential for advocacy on um, on various levels there um, and, and, and various lessons learned. And like I said, we'll release some more resources on that. But as a follow-up to this is we saw that there is viability for microgrids. Um, we wanted to then assess, well, actually just how, how big is this potential market for microgrids, VPPs, um, community batteries and, and you know, um, mid-scale, non-utility owned community assets. So what QFF has now launched is a local energy market research project um, that's currently underway. Um, so if you are interested in participating, um, we are just identifying that emerging market. You can um, have a scan of that QR code. We'll also um, send it out in the in the wrap up email. Um, but we're really wanting to um, capture that emerging market, understand what the potential impact is if that market is realised, and then use that to help advocate for um, a win-win scenario between consumers and networks on that. So that's just an exciting bit there. We have a question through from Alan. Do you see that small generation aggregators um, will have a role to play in the value issue, the guys that are set up to sell on the spot market? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Short answer, uh, full answer, absolutely. And um, and this is where we look back to the grid as a platform, right? Um, where there's probably going to have to be a fundamental shift in in the value um, levers of, of the grid is how can we best integrate these aggregated consumer-owned resources and make sure that the, the grid still has a viable business model, that those assets are all integrated, interconnected and optimised, and also that the consumer receives benefit from the real value they're contributing to the grid. So absolutely yes. And microgrids are just one um, of many um, 
um, assets that, that can offer that value to the grid. Any other questions before we wrap up? We'll, oh, sorry, Stephen, uh, go Patty, ahead. Can I just, <laughs> yes. um, I just make one comment that, that we've been thinking down here. If we put um, renewable energy systems like Wallandra on 100 farms in Gippsland that are 100 kilowatts each, that's a 10 megawatt solar farm. That's probably 20 megawatt hours of batteries that are distributed across a wide area that can be orchestrated and help supply the people who can't go and put solar on their plants. And if you do that in conjunction with the network provider, then you can create a complete solution that, that is based on agriculture uh, that can work as a single entity. And I could not think of a better way to wrap up that webinar. Thank you so, so much, um, everyone, for your brains and curiosity and and um, and expertise. Um, it's been a really wonderful project, and I think this is just the start of um, much, much more exciting innovation on the technical, financial and regulatory fronts. If you have any questions, please do reach out. We'll make sure we send um, the right contact details for each of our speakers today as well. Thank you very much and have a good uh, rest of your day. Well Thanks, done. Manuel. See ya. Cheers.